Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. <coughs> Certification of closed session. May I have a motion, please? I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board well in closed session discussed only public business. Matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered. I have a second, please. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Sirs, are we call the uh, vote, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. That brings us to item 3.01, Pledge of Allegiance. Kira Van Dusen is going to lead us in the pledge. Kira, will you come forward, please? Kira is a third grader at Matthew Whaley Elementary, and she enjoys dancing, cooking, piano, and tennis. Go ahead. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kira. <coughs> you have a lovely name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings us to item 3.02, calling the roll. Ms. Jenna, Ms. Serza, will you please call the roll? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Item 3.03, .03, approval of the agenda. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Call the roll, Ms. Serza. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Appro uh, agenda's been approved as presented. And that brings us to item 4.01, announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lois Wine, the library media specialist at Warhill High School, has now published. Lois wrote a chapter about the history of school librarians titled, 100 Years of School Library Standards, the Evolution of the School Library. In the book, School Librarianship, Past, Present and Future, that it was edited by Susan W. Allman. Ms. Wine's chapter follows the progress of school libraries and the role in the school community through nearly a century. Congratulations to Lois. Students in math classes across the division celebrated Pi Day on March 14th. Pi Day is an annual celebration of the mathematical symbol Pi. In pre-calculus classes at Lafayette High School, students used logarithms to determine the ingredients to make cream cheese brownie pies. Norge Elementary had a contest to decide who could memorize the most, the most digits of Pi. This is a creative way to get students engaged in mathematics. Clara Bird Baker Elementary will host their second annual STEAM Night on March 23rd. The STEAM committee has planned amazing activities to involve students and families actively in the engineering process. They will also learn about college careers in STEAM and building community relations. Everyone is invited to join this free event at CBB. Spring musical season is here. These shows display and express the amazing talent of our division students and staff. Check the WJCC website calendar for upcoming dates and times at schools throughout the division. I'd like to thank students, staff, and community members for all of the hard work they put into making these shows an incredible success. These are all of the announcements I have this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Ms. Ownby? <coughs> yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to give an update on the student advisory um, committee meeting that I attended on March 8th, which was held at Warhill <coughs> High School. Dr. Heron um, coordinated uh, or hosted a focus group of the students where she asked students what were what has made their experience um, the best as a high school student um, and their tenure with WJCC what are some things that the division could do better to help improve their high school experience um, and what are some things that they hope future generations coming behind them would get to experience in WJCC a few of the highlights um, students noted some of the things that have made their experience best 
um, are the teachers, guidance counselors, athletics, fine arts, course selection, diversity in terms of their student um, peers, um, the Pathways Program at Warhill. Some things they would hope we could maybe improve were food in the cafeteria, <laughs> choice, cost, um, and also discipline. Um, some things to look forward to in the future. They hope some of the peers who come behind them could have an opportunity to have expanded AP courses, more academic rigor. Um, students were looking for more college preparatory experiences, um, some options to ensure that they are really ready. Um, one for um, applying to colleges, but then once they get there to be successful in college. Then on March 9th, I attended a special education advisory committee meeting where the Jamestown um, Exceptional Eagles program presented, and they presented here a few weeks ago. Um, they shared with the SEAC committee what they're doing in terms of um, peers working together, peers with um, disabilities, peers without disabilities, and spreading the word to end the word. They created bands, which are really cool. They've distributed through um, <coughs> Jamestown High School, and there's one for each school board member, and the band says spread the word to end the word. They're hoping, again, to um, push this this idea and this notion forward in every school here in WJCC. Ideally, each of our 15 schools will have a club where um, our typically developing students and their um, peers with disabilities are working together and, and learning and spending some extracurricular time together. Um, they're also hoping to host an annual games day here in the division where they can celebrate students with disabilities and so they hope to work again across the division to bring that to fruition. Um, they also had a, a guest speaker, um, PT, which is the Parent Educational Advisory Training Center, came and talked about the kinds of free training they offer to parents who have students with special needs and folks can Google that. Um, but they do prepare students, parents who have students with special needs and IEPs to um, attend IEP meetings. They don't attend the meetings with parents, but they help support parents and understand that process. The next SEAC meeting will be held April 13th. It's open to the public. They, they will have a guest speaker, Dr. Hartley Huber, who's with the School of Education here at William & Mary, and um, the body of the last 10 years of her research is in peer relations and inclusive settings. So if folks are interested in that, I would encourage them to come to the SEAC meeting, which will be held at the Rec Center at 6.30 on April 13th. Ms. Hummel? Um, yes, I would like to report on the WJCC Foundation. Uh, we met last week, and Dr. Heron was, was with me. Uh, in the past two years, the WJCC Foundation has uh, awarded over $70,000 in innovative teaching grants to teachers in the WJCC uh, system. And what uh, we want to do is figure out whether or not the timing of when we're um, putting the application out to be live is an appropriate time. We want to know if uh, Actually, filling out the application uh, is is clear and easy, and we want to know how the teachers feel about the way the awards are actually um, announced and uh, how the awards are actually implemented. So to that effect, we're putting a survey together to survey the staff and faculty of WJCC to ask them those questions so that we'll have more information moving forward to try to just keep improving the process so that we can continue to offer great innovative grants to teachers within the school system. Any other announcements? That moves us to um, item 5.01, board recognitions, for which there are a lot of smiling faces out in the gallery. So thank you, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight we have a number of individuals to recognize. Let's begin by congratulating the Jamestown Girls Swim Team for being named the 2016-17 VHSL 4A Girls State Champions. The team has earned this title for four consecutive years. I'd like to invite head coach Molly Sandling to come up to the podium to announce the team members. Students, as your name is called, please come forward and remain at the front for a group photo. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you to the board and to Dr. Heron for recognizing these amazing athletes and what they've been able to accomplish for four years. Uh, we'll begin with Ashley Adams. She is also a state champion in the 200 medley relay. Shay Bursky. Shay Bursky, Catherine, mm -hmm. 
Catherine Burroughs, <laughs> Haley Carvajal, <laughs> Vanna Champagne, <laughs> Margaret Dawson, <laughs> Haley Downer, <laughs> Katie Duff. Katrina Early, <laughs> Ashley Gillum, <laughs> Carissa Hardy, <laughs> Victoria Hardy, <laughs> Brooke Harlow, <laughs> Kylie Johnson, Abby Larson, who is also a state champion in the 200 medley relay, the 200 freestyle relay, the individual event, the 50 freestyle, and individually in the 100 freestyle. <laughs> Adeline Lurs. <laughs> Genevieve Meadows. Rory Meadows, Jackie Morris, Lauren Morris, Madison Nuremberg, Caitlin Pegram, who is also a state champion in the 200 freestyle relay. Abby Polanski, Emma Rice, Carter Catherine Relay, who is also a state champion in the 200 medley relay and the 200 freestyle relay. Nikki Tyler, Michaela Van Wicklin, Joelle Verab, who is also a state champion in the 200 medley relay, the 200 freestyle relay, the individual event, the 100 butterfly, and the individual 100 backstroke. <laughs> Meredith White. <laughs> Madison Wood. <laughs> and Emily Zuniga. Evening. We also have four members of the Jamestown High School boys swim team uh, named state champions for the 200 freestyle relay and coach Sandling will now announce their names as well. Corey Scheidler, <laughs> Austin Smith, <laughs> Taylor Watson, <laughs> and Matt Williams.
Congratulations to all of our swimmers. <laughs> this evening we'd also like to congratulate several Jamestown runners for their all-state indoor track titles. Students, as your name is called, please join us up front to receive your award and remain for a group photo. Lauren Connell, Kristen Long, Thorin John and Taylor Stutt placed fifth in the 4 times 800 metre race. Zach Pennicoff, Darius Reed, Jordan Turner, and Jordan Willis placed third in the four times 200 meter race. In addition, Zach Pennicoff placed sixth in the 300 meter race, and Jordan Turner fourth in the 55 meter, and Jordan Wilson second in the long jump. The National Merit Scholarship Program recognizes less than 1% of seniors nationwide for their exceptional scores on the PSAT test during their junior year. Finalists are selected based upon their academic record, participation in school and community activities, demonstrated leadership ability, and honors and awards received. Tonight, we are honored to recognize three Jamestown students for becoming 2017 National Merit Finalists. Students, please come forward as your name is called. First, Samuel Robles Hinckley. <laughs> Stephen Shamangar. Corey Scheidler. <laughs> Very well done, students. Now we turn our attention to honouring several outstanding teachers within the school division. The WJCC Teacher of the Year program allows us to pay tribute to teachers who are exceptionally skilled, dedicated and who demonstrate excellence in the classroom. Each, year, each school teacher of the year is selected by their peers for their outstanding classroom instruction and leadership. These teachers embody WJC's core values of individualism, integrity, innovation, accountability and collaboration. I am very proud to congratulate the following teachers for being named Teacher of the Year for their school. Christy Hubbard, Bright Beginnings Teacher of the Year. Unfortunately, Christy couldn't be with us tonight as she's out of, on a trip out of country that was previously planned. Robin Burford, Claire Bird Baker, Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Kelly Hersbold, DJ Montague, Teacher of the Year.
Kelly Cook, J.B. Blit, and Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Haley Sarar, James River Teacher of the Year. Courtney Fuller, Matoka Teacher of the Year. Chris Van Dusen, Matthew Willey Teacher of the Year. Miriam Balant, Norge Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Laura Effret, Rawls Bird, Teacher of the Year. Lisa Hill, Stonehouse Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Laura Trace, Berkeley Teacher of the Year. Anthony Neely, Lois S. Hornsby, Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Jacqueline Beck, Tuano, Teacher of the Year. Kristen Cosby, Jamestown Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Debbie Todd, Lafayette Teacher of the Year. Chandler McKnight, Warhill Teacher of the Year. Um, principals in the audience tonight, we have a request for a picture with you as well, so if you would make your way to the front and get ready for photographs too. Thank you. Okay, principals, up you come. Don't be shy. While the principals are coming up, if I could just say a big congratulations and a big thank you to every single teacher. I'm excited and proud of all of you. Thank you for all you do.
Congratulations again. Yeah. Madam Chair, that concludes all of our recognitions for this evening. Uh, we look forward to recognizing more individuals at the next regular meeting in April. As everybody leaves the room, I just would like to comment that it's humbling to be around such. What? You can't hear me? Well, it, yeah. <laughs> Still got to talk into the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's humbling to be around such excellence in teaching, academics, and athletics. It's quite amazing. Um, Dr. Heron, would you like to introduce the school spotlight, please? Item 5.02, when, when you feel it's the appropriate time. <laughs> Second. This evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Mike Stott, Principal of James River Elementary School, who will present the school spotlight for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Stott. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Heron, and school board members. This past summer, James River Elementary School began a collaboration with William & Mary's College Partnership for Kids program. Together, we shared ideas that would benefit the students of James River and the students at William & Mary. After sharing ideas, we designed a partnership that would be long-term with the goal of mentoring WJCC students starting at James River and following the students through high school. This program focuses on modeling appropriate academic and social behaviors of successful students. This will be achieved through modeling, goal setting, future college visits, and on-campus experiences. Currently, eight William & Mary students meet one time per week with eight second grade students from James River to have lunch, play, and talk about schools, dreams, and their futures. The idea is that the same James River Elementary students will continue with a CPK mentor each year until they graduate from WJCC schools. As the JRE students get older, we hope to take field trips to local colleges and universities and to create an excitement about what the future holds for them. Next to talk a little bit about our history of this program is Ms. Marie Vallone, my assistant principal. At the beginning of the fall semester, college students interested in volunteering in the Williamsburg community attended a volunteer fair hosted by the college. Those interested in mentoring elementary school students completed an application. The, applica the applications were reviewed and applicants who met the criteria were given an interview. The interviews were conducted by CPK leadership and those selected attended a two-day training on mentoring given by the National Mentoring Partnership. The mentors then recruited interested families by attending back-to-school night at JRE. 
Once the JRE students were identified, CPK leadership and JRE staff worked to pair the mentors and mentees based on personalities and an interest inventory. It is our pleasure to introduce to you our CPK mentors and leaders, Fiona and Maurice, who will talk to you about the program. <clears throat> So the best part that I look forward to every single week is coming in on Wednesday afternoons to be with these little mentees. I think I have loved the building of positive relationships that we have started. I love coming in and being their friend and having them know that we are here for them to trust us, for us to guide them, and to know that we're here to listen and to play games and to just do whatever they want. I think I've also grown to appreciate what it means to be unique and to have a gift and a talent in, in every single child. I love doing activities with them where you get to see their smiles when they do something they're talented at, something as simple as racing with the mentors and winning because they're so much faster than us. It just <laughs> it gives me so much pleasure to see that. And I think this mentoring program has been so great for both the kids and us. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the best parts about mentoring is coming in and seeing the kids' faces light up when we walk in the room each week to come pick them up. We started this program because we know from research that a sense of belonging in schools is one of the huge keys to success in schools. And I think I can speak for all of our mentees and mentors when I say that we've definitely found our place at James River. The staff and teachers and families and everyone have been so welcoming and encouraging. And the collaboration we have is really helping us build the strongest possible systems of su support for these kids in school and out of school. I think one of my favorite memories of the year was when we held a mentoring celebration at the school and invited the mentees and their families. Not only did we get to meet the other important adults in our kids' lives, but we also got to show them that they have loads of people standing behind them and supporting them both in and after school. So that's enough about us. Now you get to meet the kids. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Jennifer Smith. I'm the school counselor at James River. And I would like to introduce to you four fabulous dolphins who want to share with you a little bit about their experiences with their CPK mentors. So we're going to start over here with Marquel. Hi, my name is Marquel. I like playing basketball and coloring with my mentor. We make stuff like paper airplanes and play games, like real light, green light. I like going to the gym and going outside with her too. I like talking about what I want to do in school and my favorite subject is math. Okay, Brianna. Hi, my name is Brianna. I like having a mentor. I like eating lunch with her and playing soccer. I know she goes to college one day. I want I hope to go to college too. I want to I want to go to college to be a doctor so I can help people. Jeremiah? Uh, my hi. My name is Jeremiah. I like my mentor because he is so funny. He tells me jokes. One of my favorite things to do with my mentor is play games. He takes me outside to play. He builds volcanoes with me too. We build volcanoes because I like science. And Lucas. Hi. Hi, my name is Lucas. I like having a mentor because she plays with me and talks with me. We talk about what we want to do next time and what we like liked about today. 
And then Jesse was unable to be with us tonight, and he wrote, Hi, my name is Jesse. I like having a mentor because you get to play fun activities with them like basketball. I love to be with Mary Kate. We get to talk about what we want to be when we grow up. I want to be a math teacher because I like math. I'd like to conclude by thanking a few people that helped us get this program off the ground. First, I'd like to recognize Ms. Sherry McKinney. I think she's here with us today, Ms. McKinney. Um, she's with the College of William Mary and the CPK program for working with James River. And she's helped us create, implement, and support this program. I'd also like to recognize the eight William Mary students, Fiona Crabe, Maurice Gobreo, EJ Jackson, Caitlin Witzel, Carolyn Berg, Mary Kate Mayer, Lila Sueda, and Nancy rodriguez Gromano, who come each week to mentor our James River students. Finally, I'd like to thank the JRE families who are here this evening to support our partnership. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Do, are there any board member co comments or questions? Please. I, I just would like to say that um, every every time uh, we see some one of these spotlights, it just uh, makes my heart happy to see all the innovative things that we are doing, the positive things we're doing in the WJCC school system, and how lucky we are to have William and Mary right down the street. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was in college, I was not quite so community minded and it just amazes me how much the students at William and Mary give back to the community and um, I, I just want to say thank you for uh, being a good neighbor to our school kids. Thank you again for coming. I'd like to echo Ms. Hummel's uh, thanks and appreciation to the college and, and for the school division, and particularly James River's uh, commitment to collaboration. I know that kind of coordination is not easy, so thank you uh, for making it all about the kids. Um, that brings us to item 6.01, Citizens' Comments. Ms. Hummel. Okay. We have quite a few comment, uh, comment cards today, and so I want to read the instructions that I want everyone to follow. So here we go. This is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully, and we request that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Mrs. Taylor. Dr. Dave Reed, please. Madam Chair, Honorable School Board, Dr. Haran, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I also want to thank you for your service. I know oftentimes you guys do not get thanked for what you do for your commitment to our students, for your commitment to education, and I certainly appreciate the time and effort that you put in. I want to make it clear that this evening I'm not here to talk about an author, but a process. I'm not here to talk about people's choice to live the way they choose to live, but I'm here to talk about justice for all. We just pledged allegiance to the flag, and we finished with that phrase, justice for all. I am certainly for diversity, and we live in a very diverse community I believe we need to abide by the biblical principle of loving one another in the midst of our diversity. But I do believe that we need to speak about diversity in the context of justice for all. I stand before you as a local pastor, having met with other pastors in our community who are on both sides of this issue, some who are in total support of the author that has been invited to come to our schools. 
and those like me who are not. I believe when it comes to diversity, we need to talk about it in the context of justice for all and not justice for a few. I represent a large number of people in our community who feel that their freedoms have been robbed from them at the expense of justice for a few. I know you guys try hard and that you, we live in a community that is very diverse and that makes your job extremely difficult. But as we, you know, I have looked at, and, and I thank you for the communications that I've had with some of you over the weeks, uh, my understanding is the, this particular author, you guys were not aware she was coming. My understanding is also that the book that she has written that is on the book list that our students have read, you guys were also not aware of. As I look at the priorities that I certainly appreciate that you guys have put down in, on, this, on your website, particularly priority number four that says trust and authentic partnerships with family and the broader community. You know, in that, it talks about engaging family and community, ensuring the success of students. It talks about communicating with parents. Uh, when we look at the Virginia Code that another pastor is going to speak of in a moment, uh, it also talks about the parents' right to be involved in such decisions and looking at material that is presented to our students. And to be honest, I do not feel that that right has been granted to our parents. I believe that their freedom to decide when their children are ready to hear about the freedoms of other people should be the parents' decision. And I represent a group of people that feel that that freedom has been robbed from them. I do believe that you guys believe in accountability and leadership. And I believe that your desire is to fulfill the things that you have said here. And I would respectfully like to ask that you reconsider this visit. That in light of what I believe that you guys want to really work on trust in the community and, and, and trusting it from the parents, that you, until a proper procedure can be put in place, that you re visit the, this author's visit and any other person's visit to the school until a procedure can be put in place where there's proper vetting and proper communication to parents ahead of time. I know I'm out of time, Thank and you, I Pastor. certainly appreciate the ability to speak. Thank you, Pastor Reed. Ryan McAdams. Please. Good evening, honorable board members. Um, hopefully you can give me more than three minutes. I, I request that, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, like you, I'm a public servant. I know it's a hard job, and so I, without saying more, to get right to the fact, um, there's many of us that are concerned, the community parents and leaders, pastors, that are concerned about the issue with the author, Dana Levy. For the sake of you know the community who might not know about this issue, you can look it up in a Virginia Gazette article called uh, Some Concerned Over Authors' Visits to the Schools. It states in the article, um, reports that she is coming in uh, her own words to spend tales of family adventures with each family sharing a similar trait, which is same-sex marriage. Um, one of her books is included in the Battle of the Books reading program. Um, as Dr. Reed shared, our, one of our major concerns on the front end is the fact that you guys reportedly and admittedly did not even know about this happening. And the, uh, either the book included in the Battle of the Books program or her coming to speak to our elementary school children, our youngest and most vulnerable children in our community. And this woman, who a lot of us have uh, moral beliefs that are against this type of um, activity, and she is coming in to speak to our children. So. Uh, it does say in the Code of Virginia that as super, supervision of schools in each school division shall be vested in a school board, that's you, selected as provided in the chapter or otherwise provided by law. You have been elected by this community to supervise what goes on, the materials, the books, the activities that happen in our school system. And that is very clear by the Code of Virginia. I know that you would agree with that. So the question is, why did it not happen in this case? And in an ongoing process that Dr. Reed talked about, what are you going to do to convince us and to restore trust in us that you're going to take care of this in future instances to protect our children? Secondly, uh, as Dr. Reed said, it's commonly acknowledged um, in the code and also the Department of Education says it's commonly acknowledged that one of the most important components of student achievement and success is parent involvement. 
No parent, until you were uh, uh, given concerns from us, the community, were any parents notified of this author coming in to speak to our children. I, I would like you to answer why both of those, why you're not supervising this, and, and number two, why were not parents involved in this de decision? With family, uh, uh, the Family Life Education Program with issues of sexuality, it's clear that parents are supposed to be involved in anything that relates to that. And they should have the option to opt out of it. That was not, did not happen this occurrence until you were notified. So I would like, I would like you to respond to that because it's, it's broken a, a level of trust with the community. Thirdly, I know my time's running. Can you just give me one more minute? No, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. Your time is up. Well, just in closing, I mean, we feel like that, that, uh, that our rights, um, our religious rights, have been trampled in this case and our children. And it's one of our Thank deeply, you, most Mc sacredly Thank held... Thank you, Mr. McAdams. Thank you very ...sacredly much. held views that are, we should raise up our children that as parents we have the right to do that. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I know this is a much bigger issue. Thank you, Mr. Uh, McAdams. Issue. Please step away from that, diet, from that microphone. Thank please. you for the time to be able to speak to you Very much. Leanne Langston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the purpose of education is to allow people the opportunity to become better citizens through literacy. In Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, he points out that the gift of teaching must be used to serve others and that this will ultimately bring glory to God. I'd like to share five points in hopes of shedding some light on how we can become better citizens and make us a better community. Number one, intelligence. Thomas Aquinas' philosophy of scholasticism, which sought to integrate faith and reason, is one worth being identified with. Unfortunately, in today's society, Christians are not viewed as intellectuals, and it thought unreasonable that uh, to have faith in the unseen God. However, this is not, in fact, the case. Knowledge is integral in intelligently strengthen the Christian faith simply by engaging in the habits of daily Bible reading, study, and prayer, not contradictory to intelligence. Um, number two, childhood. In my research, an educator stated that schools were necessary for defining the faith in interpreting scripture, preparing ministers of the church, cultivating illiterate people. History of our great country is on the side of faith being part of education, but the legal system has changed that. What hasn't changed is in order to hold a job, be successful in a career, or even read a menu, literacy is the foundation of the academic world. In our society, we have lost the meaning of education. Now it's all about the SOLs and SAT scores. There are five stages of growth. There's childhood, uh, infancy, childhood, boyhood, adolescence, and youth. The practical information this offers helps to develop child-appropriate activities for students. The students in our elementary schools are still in the childhood stage of the educational process and should not be forced to deal with the issue of same-sex marriage as demonstrated in the books of the author mentioned. It is not appropriate subject matter for this age group. Number three, wisdom. Those of us who are involved in the educational process are not just responsible for academics. Motivating students to learn will help, will show them we want to encourage and support them. We strive to develop young people who are socially and emotionally healthy. In order for me to fulfill this seemingly overwhelming task, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In seeking his wisdom, I am better able to master the role of educator and teacher. Number four, hypocrisy. Acceptance of all has been an underlying factor into the account when teaching in a diverse classroom environment, but does not include those who identify with a biblical worldview, such as Christians like myself. This is why I'm breaking the silence and speaking up on this matter. Enough is enough. Please consider this author visit on these books is not appropriate for public reading of, um, to our students who are 8, 9, and 10 years old in the public school. Christian parents should be afforded the same consideration in that our children should not be taught the values and beliefs like that of same-sex marriage that are contrary to our beliefs in public education. Thank you, Ms. Langston. Tim Krause, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for everyone's time tonight and the opportunity to speak. 
Uh, my wife and I have been residents of James City County uh, for a little over 10 years, and three of our four kids are currently enrolled in James City County schools, including one with special needs. Um, all of our kids have received exceptional care through our school system, and we are incredibly grateful for their teachers, specialists, and all school officials who work tirelessly to provide an excellent education and make a positive difference in our kids' lives. They are true professionals. Um, we also think, we're also thankful for the hard work and leadership of the board on our behalf um, and recognize that your job of deciding what content to allow in schools in a modern world is not an easy task. Regarding the author that was invited to a writer's workshop later this month, I'm actually not here to talk about her. Uh, she's clearly a gifted person with her own values and rights. This just happens to be the current example of a broader issue. Speaking personally for a minute, from first-hand experience, I've got a, a daughter who is uh, in middle school. We all know that's going to be a challenging time. Um, but um, my family and, and our kids in particular are under an extraordinary amount of pressure these days regarding same-sex issues, not by their school teachers or staff, but more by their friends, not just to respect the rights of others despite our differences, which is, and not just to love and serve others, which is the very fabric of our beliefs, but to go beyond that and to celebrate and even promote um, others' lifestyle choices that have conflicting values to, to our kids. And if they don't take those extra steps of endorsement, they face painful social consequences. In my opinion, this illustrates a dangerous trend in our culture that has the potential to undermine religious freedom. And as a parent of impressionable uh, elementary age kids, as, as has been said by several others, I believe our schools just shouldn't go there. They shouldn't facilitate or showcase family life subjects or curricula in, in, in any way, uh, whether it be a formal course or informal parts or subjects of a course. So respectfully, uh, at a minimum, I believe our schools should respect the rights of parents to decide how to raise our, our children on these matters and, and uh, when. Uh, and to err on the side of caution by sending clearly identifiable notifications of activities that may contain family life content, and in such cases to provide welcoming alternative activities for our kids. Thank you. Mr. Krause, thank you very much. <clears throat> Peter Vlaming. Okay, I too am here to comment on the uh, the author who's been invited to speak to our elementary school students, um, <clears throat> to our fourth and fifth graders. Uh, as mentioned before, the author is a clear advocate of a certain view of marriage, um, advocating namely through her books. Uh, the subject of differing views on same-sex marriage is obviously a divisive and contentious one for our country. I think if we were to survey our community, it would be just as divisive and contentious. And so in this particular situation, by having this author who, as I said, uh, promotes uh, one view uh, in the school system, to ever come speak in the school system, it looks as though that our school division is making an implicit, implicit judgment on coming down on one side of the issue and therefore seems unsupportive of many, if not maybe the majority, uh, of the families in our district not support that issue. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vlaming. Corey Simon. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Simon. I have uh, four boys that go to Claire Bird Baker. You heard me right, four. <laughs> so, um, I just want to, you know, echo the words of uh, the the previous six people that that have uh, spoken, and just my concern for this. And it's not just as you know, some of them said, uh, it's not just uh, this author, but it's 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 processes like this. And the, over the last few days, as I've been doing research into this, I've found that. Um, one of the issues is the regional library has a um, a close connection relationship with the schools, which is great. That's not the problem, but the problem is it doesn't go. A lot of those things don't go through the board. So when they 
choose an author, it's of, it's of that library's choosing, that author, and not through the school board or, and parents. This, I feel like this almost slipped under the radar, this issue here. Um, in the gracious words of what you know, Tim Krause said, I, I do a, so much appreciate our children's school, and I appreciate all the hard work that you guys do as well. Um, I haven't really had an issue up until now, to be honest. Um, but needless to say, this presentation on the writing process, which is what you know the author is presenting as a writing process, is it's not the content in the books is not appropriate teaching material for public schools, and it puts it puts public schools in serious jeopardy of violating the establishment clause, which uh, requires government institutions to maintain a neutral stance towards religion, and it it violates our religious faith to introduce homosexual and transsexual views into our schools as an attempt to quote unquote normalize it or normalize the the environment and religion of course does not just is not just speaking about you know what what god you serve or what church you're a part of but the the actual, an, another definition an actual definition of religion is a pursuit of interest to which someone ascribes an, an importance so what I'm asking for is, is uh, as Ryan McAdams stated, to not allow this, this particular author to, to come and speak. And on a more practical note, um, what I'm asking the board to do is to respond to this by requiring in the future that material from outside authors go through the school board and allow parents to preview it first before it's allowed into our school. This can be done by simply an email sent out to parents before the author is ever scheduled to speak. And in the email, it would clearly explain to the parent how they should respond if they have a problem with the content that's being presented or the content in the, in the author's books. Um, if no response is emailed back to the board or, or the school is not contacted by a specific date, then proceed, allowing, still allowing parents to opt their children out at any time. So I, I, just, I think that's a very practical way to handle it. But... Um, I definitely think that it needs to go through the school board, and, and, and parents need to have the right to say, yeah, I don't think this is appropriate for my children. So, thank you. Very much. Sorry. Joseph Miller. Meeting, Madam Chair, honorable board members. Uh, just want to echo the comments that have come before me in saying how much I do respect the office you hold and for the job that you do for our community. Um, I have grown up in Williamsburg for all 23, 23 years of my life. I have a nine month old and another child on the way and currently reside in James City County. So it's, it is very close to my heart how, how wonderful of a job you have done and I do appreciate that. Um, I would just like to talk a brief bit about the role of local government and its transparency to the people that it serves. Um, I've, I've always had great luck with coming to board meetings and going to the board of supervisors and city councils and asking for information. And it's always been readily available. Documents are available online. In fact, I believe these are being streamed. These meetings are streamed online to provide accessibility for everybody. Um, with respect to some of the current school policies in selecting authors and visitors to come and address kids at such a vulnerable age, I mean, third through fifth grade, I've struggled to explain some of these deep issues to seven, eight, nine-year-olds. And I, I would ask that the board create some form of procedure or process that is transparent and visible to all local members through which these types of authors or visits can be uh, thoroughly vetted and uh, have open transparency for all the community to see. Thank you so much. Mr. Miller. Jerry Farrell. Good evening, I'm Jerry Farrell. I'm here as the Vice President of the Education Association. And we would like to thank you all who took the time to meet with us this week. We, um, you know our concerns and our views on the budget, and we just ask you to please reflect carefully before choosing to vote on the budget tonight. But I also feel called moved at, to speak on a personal level. Um, I first think that the book needs to be looked at 
as for what the book is, the purpose of the book, and it has nothing to do with the lifestyle of the family. And I also believe that there are people that we serve, our children that we serve, who come from parents of same sex. And I know personally of a, someone in my family who has become a social worker, who's worked for people, who do the community, and should not be um, judged by their choice. And so I feel like some of the speakers tonight are making that same judgment. But that's on my personal note. I'm not, that's not for the association. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Carolyn Becerra. Good evening. How are you? Um, first of all, Mrs. Farrell, I just wanted to say that um, thank you for your comments. And um, my heart goes out to you, and um, I hope that you don't feel judged, and, and that's not anybody's intention. Um, in, oh, in I'm sorry, you need to speak to the Yes, chair, okay. You. So <laughs> um, I wanted to, I am a mother of two children at Williamsburg, James City County. One is at Matoka, a fifth grader, Anik Becerra, and, um, and my son, Anders Becerra, is at Warhill High School. And I did want to voice concern over the book, um, because as a teacher also, um, I teach at West Point Public Schools, and for any, anything that could possibly, you know, err, err on the side of caution, any movie that could possibly be something that the parents would not wish for their child to see, we always send something home and allow the parent to have a signature and then another option. Um, and I know that you were surprised as well by not having any information on this, so I think that we're on the same boat. Um, but what I wanted to request is I know that uh, in Williamsburg, James City County, you have an awesome uh, phone system that any little announcement, it can go automated through the phone. I think that would be the best situation, not even an email, but that phone system for anything in the future um, that is of this nature. Um, and especially, like Ryan McAdams said at the elementary, the most vulnerable, not because um, people's lifestyle choices of close family members you know, that we judge them, but because we care for our children. And it's the freedom for all, justice for all, like um, Mr. Re Dr. Reeves said, that we, um, we want to be able to raise our youth um, as parents. That's a, a very precious thing to us. Um, and so my proposal is that because this process was not done the right way, the way that is to your liking nor to ours, um, that we kind of renege it if possible, just like Ryan McAdams said, that we just, you know, if there's any way that you can cancel the visit, um, yes, maybe the message, the intention was an honorable one. However, parents um, have the right to raise their children the way they'd like to and to introduce those themes and present them in the way that they would like to um, for those certain topics, although that probably wasn't the main message. Um, does that make sense? Yes? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do those verbal things, but I'm not. Okay, anyways. Um, the other point I wanted to say is that my personal belief is that as same-sex couples, Yes, they have the right to do that. However, it deprives the child. Um, a girl who has two mothers is just deprived the right to have a father. And um, that's my personal view. That's not a good thing, you know? And it's not like orphans that are adopted and they didn't get their biological parents, the two of them, or, um, you know, a divorce, tragic things happen. However, this is intentional. And that's Thank you, sad. Ms. Becerra. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Jill Pyle. Thank you. I've never spoken at a supervisor meeting. Um, but welcome. welcome to the new superintendent. Um, uh, we're from California, and I'm very impressed by the Williamsburg School District. and. James City County School District. We're staying here with my fifth grade son at Rawlsburg. Saw the principal, saw the teacher, his teacher of the year here it was here, Miss Eford. And we've been very impressed. My son's in the gifted class. He's learning the Rubik's Cube, um, uh, binary numbers, all kinds of things that I'm I can't teach him myself. But um, uh, so very impressed. And I uh, love the school district, a little worried about middle school. Um, and also, I just 
learned about this topic, which I don't agree with, you know, from San Francisco, California, so I'm really hyper vigilant, hyper aware of everything that's going on. But so when I first heard about the topic, it was in the last word. Um, it's kind of the gossip um, part of the newspaper about Williamsburg. And uh, the man said, well, I agree with same-sex marriage, but uh, not everybody does. So I think the teacher should be aware. You know, uh, The parents should be aware. So that makes sense. When I was in the school system in California, we had a little uh, note at the bottom of the announcements. And you cut it out, yes, I opt in for this, or no, I don't. When I taught third grade, if you taught, if you had a PG movie, you got to get approval for it, which I don't know if, I haven't had to hardly do any approvals. We've gone there, third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, so uh, anyways, uh, then the second time I heard about it was in the newspaper, and um, I, I, so I emailed the principal, and she said, well, we're going to have an, uh, information about it later in the week. So I'm so excited. Maybe an opt-out form, opt-in form, something about the topic. Maybe the schools don't advocate this, but this is a book that somebody wrote. You know, because it's a book that's about the Fletchers. It's not like Heather has two mommies. It's not obvious. I didn't know. I went to the library to get it. I put it on reserve. I'll read it. You know, I don't agree with it, but, you know, have an open mind, but in San Francisco, don't let your mind fall out. You know, it's like, but there was no information about it, um, about the subject, the content matter. Um, it's going to be about writing, but I just thought, if she's passionate about what she's writing about, if a little third grader, eight-year-old says, what do you write about, Miss uh, Levy? You know, she's going to, what's she going to say? And... You know, if Dr. Seuss came to talk, he would talk about a cat in the hat. Or if Mo Willems, who came to the library, talked, he would talk about elephant and piggy. You know, I think in fifth grade in Visions, we read, he read Nuffle Bunny. So, thank, thank you, you very much. Piles. Thank you. Klaus Marks. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, I'm sort of off topic with all the other comments. Uh, mine uh, is concerning the school budget and uh, whether the board uh, has been aware that there's been a change in uh, purchasing policy with the schools and James City County in, in, in general. Uh, I was made aware of it by an email from one of my customers. Like I said, I'm sorry, I probably should have told you who I was. My name is Klaus Marks with Office Equipment. And I have a small office supply business with my wife. She's been in business for over 23 years. We've been in the county for 35 years. But anyway, what we had uh, gotten in an email, uh, I was told by Chris, uh, someone in the uh, purchasing department uh, to cancel my order for some cartridges they had ordered. Her reason is that you had to be a vendor contractor with Williamsburg James City County Schools. I'm not sure how you go about it. I'm sorry I love doing business with you all, locally, friendly, 24-hour service. You have always served as well. Uh, I tried to contact the school board. They directed me to uh, the purchasing department, uh, uh, the financial officer. They directed me to someone in James City County purchasing. Uh, I spoke with them. They said, yes, it's true. You have to be, uh, have to have a contract. We've adopted the, uh, the state contract for purchasing, which uh, is for the larger office supplies, which is uh, Staples and Office Depot and that uh, you would have to uh, uh, bid on those contracts when they're due in like 2018, 2019. Uh, I uh, asked her if uh, in, in adopting those contracts, would that be any provisions for SWAM, which is uh, small women and minority-owned businesses? She said no. I asked if we, uh, if we were to uh, be cheaper on certain items, would that make a difference? No, you're not on the contract. We can't do business with you. Uh, then I ask, you know, we've sold the uh, school system uh, cartridges for over eight years that we were less expensive. And in this instance, we found out that we're on one color uh, machine, we're uh, $90, $90 cheaper per cartridge, and there are four cartridges in the machine, and there's hundreds of cartridges in the system. And we've saved the, the county tens of thousands of dollars per year. And I was wondering if, if you were aware of that. 
Uh, our cartridges are American made. Uh, they are uh, quality cartridges. Uh, the buyer's lab has, has tested them. Uh, they perform as well as uh, the original equipment manufacturer, which is Lexmarks and, and HPs and what have you. And uh, we feel that this is something that should be looked at. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Bill Porter. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Porter. I'm the chair of the Williamsburg Regional Library. Uh, and I'm not here to tell you about policy or anything else. I'm here to say that, that there's been a partnership between the schools and the library for the Battle of the Books for many years, and also the author visits for many years. The author, when they come, regardless of what their book, they're there to talk about how to do good writing and to try to excite kids into becoming writers and readers. They talk about how to become, how an idea becomes a novel and the importance of revising your work and is how that writing is hard and why most writers don't get, don't do it alone. They always have some help. Uh, and that rejection is what happens to almost every author. I want to say that they, they are there to try to get children into reading and into writing. Uh, and it, it helps express themselves. It does a number of things. I'm uh, sorry there's controversy surrounding this. And you all have to see if you want to do a policy dealing with that issue. But most of all, I want to say that this partnership has been an excellent thing for many years. And we certainly want it to continue. And we want to continue to have good readers in our schools because lifelong learning is based really on being able to be a good reader. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you for giving me the opportunity. And I guess if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Although I think you said that doesn't happen. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Are there any more cards for this evening? Sorry, let me turn that off. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That brings us to the consent agenda, which I will read. Um, item 7.01, approval of the minutes from the following meetings, uh, February 21st, 2017 and March 7, 2017. 7.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll, February 2017. 7.03, personnel actions, as presented. 7.04, resolution R-13-17, the month of the military child. 7.05, resolution R-14-17, VSBA business honor roll. 7.06, retire policy ECB, buildings and grounds maintenance and replace with policy EC, buildings and grounds management and maintenance. 7.07, .07, retire policy EFA, food purchasing. 7.08, revise policy EFB, free and reduced price food services. 7.09, retire policy EFE, food service record and reports and replace with policy EF, food service management. And finally, item 7.10, revise and rename policy IJ, school guidance and counseling programs to school counseling programs. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we accept the, cons we can accept the consent agenda as, as you have read it. A second? Second. Any discussion? Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Ms. Cook. 
Aye. Thank you. The uh, consent agenda is approved. Um, now that moves to item 8.01. Before I toss it over to Dr. Heron, I would like to make a few remarks. Um, number First, as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe that I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2017-18 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you. Um, just as a reminder for the public, in uh, February, uh, uh, Superintendent Heron presented her budget of need to us. We discussed it uh, early in March. Um, and uh, talked about how uh, this, uh, her budget of meet, need may not meet the resources that are available in the community um, by our local funding partners. Um, last week, we had a joint meeting with City Council and uh, Jabe City County Board of Supervisors, which uh, this budget was a, a, a topic of discussion. And now we're having our second discussion. We may adopt the budget um, later on in the meeting, or we may uh, just continue discussion and then go move uh, towards adoption uh, next week on the 28th. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Heron for an update. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you've been provided a, a draft copy of the budget following the discussion at the last meeting. We incorporated the items that we were given upon consensus of the board and really just opening the, the, the dais for conversation tonight around the question of the budget and to answer any additional questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Um, all right. Bonby, do you have, would you like to add anything? To um, yes, I think one additional area that we might want to look into for um, saving some pennies and, and shaving the budget because we know based on our conversation with our funding partners on Friday, um, there is no additional funding and planned um, from the county side anyway, so I think we should consider travel. So if we could open that for discussion. Do you have any specific um, questions about travel, Ms. Ombi? If there's a way we could consider limiting travel to maybe in-state, I be would like any other ideas that board members have. Yeah, Dr. Heron, do you have any uh, facts I believe, on that for us? I believe we can give you a, an overview generally of what amount is in the budget for professional development and, and travel, just a big number. Um, obviously, most of that is, is for teachers and for staff to develop their skills and knowledge to be able to do their job well, so it's a very important part of who we are. Um, however, obviously, it's a very tight year, so we would look to your guidance on if we want to do anything with that or not. Ms. Berta, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Um, there is approximately $240,000 in staff development and travel allocated in the proposed budget as it stands. The only cautionary tale I would say in that is that included in that is any internal funding that we would provide to bring speakers to us. Several departments have tried to think out of the box on how to impact a larger volume of staff rather than sending people away. So there is some of that mechanism of funding that would fund people coming to us to develop the larger population of staff. Um, do you know off the top of your head what school board travel uh, is or what that um, line item is? One second. Okay, sorry. That's all right. I feel like it was answered. Well, the, at the, the NSBA con conference last year was around two thousand dollars. Oh, two thousand dollars per person. Per person. Per, per, person. Head. per yeah. person. I believe the amount each year depends on the location of yeah. the conference. Um, there is actually a. In, in school board policy, I believe there's also a requirement for board members to complete some. Uh, development as a board member as well, and that's what that funding is, is for. Yeah. There is, because the school board is combined with the superintendent um, in that same cost center, there is $31,150 as it stands in the proposed budget for travel for the school board and the superintendent. <laughs> okay. Is there a way of breaking down um, the the cost of people coming 
the speakers that are coming in are going to do professional development with teachers and, and the teachers that are traveling. Is there a way to do that? I would have to go back and look in the individual cost center budgets that were developed because it was specific when we had our discussions as the budget was developed, what was internal and what was external. I don't have that with me this evening. Okay, thank you. Dr. Beers, do you have Yeah, I, um, I'm not going to that meeting in Denver. And I made part of the decision for that was I, I am concerned about amount of money that's set aside. I know it's a small, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's a, but it's a symbolic uh, fund. And I, um, I, I, uh, I know that uh, we're, it wouldn't make any difference because that money's already been set aside for this year, so I know that. I know that. But I, I, I very much agree with um, um, the uh, restricting our travel to within the state. Yes. Um, I've looked over um, a rather detailed explanation of um, a professional development that uh, somebody on the board requested. And I only saw two sentences, actually one and a half, that actually spoke to school boards. And it was very clear that the professional development could occur um, locally, state, regionally, or nationally. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to, um, if I need additional professional development um, to make me a better board member, to attend some of the functions and some of the um, professional development opportunities that are available within the state, and it's a lot less expensive. And I, I fully support um, travel money for uh, teachers. I, I'm not, that's sort of my orientation. I'm probably not quite as um, reluctant to uh, restrict the travel of administrators, but I, I, I think um, it is part of who our teachers are, whether you bring somebody in or they go somewhere else. Um, I'd like to see a, probably, in terms of travel and professional development, a greater emphasis on a trainer of trainers model where individuals, people who go away, go to conferences, or have people come in here, they learn, uh, they gather information, they try stuff out, and then they share it in, a, um, um, in, a, in, a, in an organized kind of fashion. Um, that model has been around a long time. Um, and it is not always necessary to go outside of your own school division identify some of the very best professional educators who can provide some of the staff development that, that we might need. So I'm, um, um, that's about all I'm going to say about that, but I, I really feel that uh, if I'm going to ask somebody to cut, uh, you know, their, their travel or, or some of the other areas that, um, I don't have any problem uh, staying within, this, within the Commonwealth. I don't need to do, and probably that, well, never mind, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> Anything else on, on travel specifically? I'll, I'll throw something in there. As a new school board member last year, um, my, uh, my experience going to the National School Board Association meeting in Boston was that, um, it was worth every penny that was spent in making me a better, more informed board member. Do I need to go to a National School Board Association meeting every year? No, I, I, I don't think I do. But I, I do think that we shouldn't um, limit just carte blanche the ability for our school board members to be as um, well trained as possible. Um, now, Dr. Beers, you have a lot of experience in uh, K through 12. I don't. So for me, hearing about school budgets, hearing about uh, all the civil uh, rights kind of uh, Title I, the legal, all of the things that I need to be a good board member and know, um, 
I feel like I, I need to be trained. Um, and some of that training, yes, can be done in Virginia, but that's National School Board Association meeting. I came back, I spent three days of solid meetings and went to every single one of them and came back with a lot of information. Um, so anyway, that that's you, just my opinion. That you shared. That I shared, by the way, with all of you. <laughs> so I did. I shared. So. Yeah, I, 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 I would. I, I, I have to agree with you. Um, I think with an incoming school board member, um, I think as much as you can get that first year is really important. So I, yeah, I, I will um, uh, amend my comments because I, that is important. I, I. Mr. Kelly, did you? Well, Madam Chair. Um, we, we come to the school board because we believe in education and we believe in education for kindergarten kids, uh, seniors in high school, as well as for the board. Um, you know, nothing can be more expensive than a board member who does not understand their role in their job. Um, and uh, just because you win a, get enough votes to, to win an election or to get an appointment to sit up here does not mean you know what you're doing. Um, I have been going to board meetings, I've been going to conferences since 2010. I bring something back from every board meeting, every uh, conference that I've gone to. Um, I've bought books. I've, uh, you know, been engaged in uh, every session absolutely possible. And you know, those sessions are very tracked, very well tracked, and very controlled to understand how many uh, sessions you go to. Um, and so, you, so as a board member, you really have to be engaged in your development and in your understanding. And um, it's not just the first year. It's the it's every year that you're on school law changes things change, um, you know. And board members who who don't understand their role can cost the school division hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in legal fees, you know, inappropriate contact with pe with uh, with folks. Um, that is that is it is vital that you develop an understanding of your role. Um, you know, the first year. Um, you know, you come on the board in January and you go to the conference in March, uh, your head is still spinning. As you, as you go, to, go follow on, you start to begin to understand more and more what your job is and what your job is not. And uh, I just believe that uh, for, for an investment of $30,000 um, in the development of a school, of the school board, I think that is, uh, the return on investment of that is, is uh, extraordinary. So I would... Uh, not want, I would not want it to look at that board members getting professional development and taking every advantage of, of learning um, as a bad thing. So I just, uh, I think that's a very important aspect of our job. I, I don't think it's a bad thing uh, for training, but I think in this, in this particular year that we're looking at and we're having huge budget restraints, we've already been told by uh, the county administrator that there's not going to be any more money. And if for one year we don't go to the NSBA, I don't think that that necessarily uh, means that we won't be well trained. So I'm, I'm for, uh, um, depending where, the, of course, if the conference is in Virginia next year, that's fine. It's not. But if it's, uh, it's not San Antonio, um, I would be for, for going to the NSBA conference for a year. And, um, and while I agree with Mr. Kelly that uh, school board members that aren't trained do cost the division money, on the other hand, uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we need those dollars in the budget. So, um, Out of curiosity, for those who traveled, is there a per diem in place? There is. We follow the GSA guidelines from, from the federal government. Trying to find a happy medium following that. All right. <laughs> Anything else on travel? I, yeah, I just want to um, add, I, I, I'm, I agree with uh, everyone who's talked about the value of going to NSBA. Um, I'm about to go to my second one. And, and last year, you know, the board member, you do, you scan in to every meeting, so, you're, you're, so it's highly accountable, um, highly transparent. Uh, and then, uh, you know, most, most members, uh, all members share what they learned in, uh, in some way, shape, or form so that it's not just that information isn't just contained within uh, the mind of one uh, board member. And I, I'll be honest with you, I need all the professional development I can get. Um, so, but that said, I, I think for um, 
next year I would be happy to limit board me member travel to just Virginia I'd also be happy instead to just agree to send you know the superintendent and one or two board members so that um, we work with whoever the chair is and determine who, who best could go but maybe trim it um, some so that um, yeah so that yeah, yeah. I agree. you I like agree. that so that's a good compromise okay. all right so whatever that works out to be Mathematically, so, Madam Chair, do you have a sense of how much you would like to trim <coughs> that budget, just to give us very specific direction in case we get to the uh, all board all board tonight? member travel limited to Virginia, and and then send uh, no more than three uh, people sitting up here to NSBA. Is that does that? I'm getting. So we're I'm actually getting still fairly. Dollars. Huh? Hey, can you give me dollars? <laughs> yeah, if we're going to try to uh, reach consensus towards most yes. of the budget tonight. It'd be it'll be really helpful to to take that thirty thousand and say we want to cut a certain portion off for for next year in in this. Okay, so yeah, year. so subtract eight thousand out of the budget, I guess. Would thank you. Yeah. Thank I mean that it was two thousand per. That was the average, right? That was told so times four board members not going next year is eight thousand yeah. dollars. So if you could trim it, thank you. Thank you. It's Sorry very helpful. So nope. Thank you very much. Clearly need math professional development as well. Um, okay, so um, are there any other comments about the where we left the budget last time? Yes, Dr. Beers. Um, I just would like to comment on a question that I raised um, with an email to uh, the superintendent and board members um, about what would what, what would it look like? What would the numbers be? If we reduced every cost center um, by a half a percent or by um, one percent, recognizing that um, uh, you know the substantial amount of the funds in that cost center um, are uh, basically untouchable, and um, um, Ms. Berta came up with uh, for if we have a one percent reduction, in other words, in other words. Um, the managers of each of those cost centers over their budget that they have submitted and reduce it by 1%, we save $176,000. If we could reduce it by one and a half or two, recognizing we can't go very far, I know that, um, that would be over $200,000 approaching. I don't. I haven't done it myself, so I don't know how far we can go with that. But but I, I'm thinking. Okay, if, if we could do one percent, could we do two percent or one Bears, and a half percent? Dr. Bears, let me have Miss Berta explain. Just that was a, a stretch across the whole organization to get that figure, and then let us try to break it down for you in terms of reality. Because some departments, we would be able to make a little bit of a shift and others are so tight okay okay that, that so maybe not do a blanket then, so then, it becomes but, really but really average. difficult We're, to do yeah but try to so this she'll explain the the average how she got that figure and then for example in operations next year we already know that the cost of fuel is electricity electricity has just we've just been given a new figure it's risen and it's going to be literally to the wire where we are but miss bird if you just give us a sense of of, of understanding of your figure sure so in evaluating this, I took non-personnel expenditures. So we didn't want to touch salary benefits. Number one, we really can't. Um, if It would negate the purpose of a, a salary increase. So looking at that, we're looking at about $17 million. So the 1% is where I derived that from, the 176,944. We would not be able to cut, and particularly in administration, administration is very lean. Um, there's not 1% available to cut, for example, in finance or in HR. Um, we would impact contractual obligations that are there. Uh, in addition with uh, operations, we just found out this week that the electricity costs are rising by 2%. So we took a cut out of that electricity budget last year and maintained that cut in this year's budget thinking that things were going to remain stable. Uh, also in operations, the volatility of the fuel market, given the circumstances that are going on at the national level, there's no telling what's going to happen with vehicle fuel. 
So um, in order to achieve this, I'm not saying it's unattainable, but in order to achieve it, it would not be 1% from every individual cost center. We would need to evaluate cost centers and see who would be able to support more of that 1%, and then others would not be impacted at all because of the sheer nature of not being able to do so. So uh, I just want to make that clear that if that's the choice of the board, and the other piece to that is that would negate part of the allocation that we give to the instructional uh, resources at the schools because we allocate on a per pupil basis and we've developed that formula to be consistent and equitable across schools and how we assign funding, that would have an impact on there if we chose to go to the schools to also take a 1%. So just some variables to think about when we begin to go down that road of adjusting um, by a percentage. I'm not saying it's unattainable. I'm, I just want you to know what goes into that thought process behind the scenes. And when we think about what has been presented to us by the superintendent, there was a line item uh, in possible savings in, to the tune of about 12000 that speaks to the per pupil allocation. Is that correct? When, when we developed the budget process back in September or October, we, we did not have the report from Future Think at that time. So we were basing that on prior year projections, which then got trued up. Okay. in November when Future Think came out. So those were adjusted. Um, and of course, they'll be adjusted again when we really have September 30th enrollment come to light um, to be able to do some of that balancing act. I, I would kind of be in favor of, of sharing um, the pain, so to speak, just a little bit at with your discretion, of course, of where the 1% comes. but. I think anything that just can be really thinly, thinly spread across a wide uh, area of cost centers would perhaps be doable or more at least stomachable. <laughs> Dr. Heron? If, if we just would have the consensus of the board, we can, we will make that happen. Well, yeah, Mrs. Young? Oh, how, how much money do we need to trim? That's that's. I want a dollar figure. Can can I highlight what we've done so far in your sure. document? Sure. Yes, that you. would be great. Thank That'd you. That'd be lovely. Um, if you can take a look at pages six and seven, to highlight the things that have been modified since our last discussion, based on what we think was consensus from the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, so number two was added as an expenditure decrease, and that is the modification of the health insurance charge um, with the addition of a $50 charge per month to employees' health plans that include spouses. That would save in the budget $189,250 if that was the uh, direction of the board. Uh, number eight originally was 480000 It has been adjusted to $374,000 to reflect the decrease of 200 laptops for the Jamestown and Lafayette Pathways delayed program. Number 17 was decreased from 135000 to 45000 also a reflection of the board's decision to delay the Pathways program at Lafayette and Jamestown. And you will see that the buses no longer remain on the list in the balancing act uh, due to the desire of the board to reduce the two replacement buses uh, to the amount of 218000 So based on where we were in the superintendent's proposed budget with the estimated funding gap um, from the city and county funding that we think is, is reality, we were at $1.4 million, $1.365 million. Okay. With the removal of the things that I just talked about and the addition of the $50 spousal charge to health insurance, that puts the board in a position of having a gap of $761,359. So we still have a gap while it's not as large as it was. Okay. So, so, oh, so to follow up on, um, well, actually, does anyone else have a comment about the 1% one, the 1 or half a percent across the board? No. Uh, Mr. Kelly. A um, couple of questions. First of all, uh, I'm not in favor of the modifications of the health insurance charge. Um, how much money did we have left over at the end of last year? Uh, it was about $2.3 million. Okay, and so at what point do you start thinking about how much money we have are going to have left at the end of this year? I already have. What number would you um, that be? 
There is a, a deal that was made with the county that we have to return $600,000 of our available fund balance to the county to support our capital improvement plan in future years. After that is considered, we have about $700,000 to get us between now and June 30th. So considering the 600000 Considering the 600000 So if we, if we get the county to roll that over to us, we're, we're good. Yes. Big if. Well, I mean, if, if we, everybody has issues, right? So, I'm, so, the, so the question we have to ask ourselves is: that we are, are we going to do what is what the what um, is required of them by us by laws to put together a budget of need? This is our need. This is, and so then, and then go from there as far as you know. Why are we trying to hit a number? We are. We should be putting together our budget of need, working with our funding partners, and then after all that comes back, figure out what we're going to do. But our job is to put together a budget of need, and and if it looks like we're gonna we're gonna be a little bit short, and that money comes back to us for next year, we're good. So I just I that's that's kind of where I am. Yeah, I, I'm not there. Uh, first first of all, I we, we've been working very hard to develop a, a cooperative relationship with our funding partners, and I think this since we already know. What the county has said, I think we're, we're forcing the issue and setting up an atmosphere of conflict, and I'm not willing to do that. I think it's part of our fiscal responsibility to get this budget to where, where it needs to be and, um, and not necessarily count on attrition funds, et cetera. We, we need to be taking a hard look at where we are, and, and so I am for uh, the 1%, taking a look at what 1% would do for us. Um, I, I have to say, um, um, I'm, I'm not in favor of, of, of doing a kind of across the uh, blanket because it doesn't feel very strategic to me, um, and, and, it, and it wouldn't be real in that the staff would have to be doing work to 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 apportion it in different places anyway because there are fixed costs or, or increase in electricity or whatever. I think if you look at number 15 on page seven. My take, my interpretation, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Heron, is that that was the kind of that's the spread the pain what? number 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 15 on page seven. Um, that is the idea of taking out the per student uh, allocation based on enrollment, and so if the board wishes to um, to decrease the budget by spreading it out across the buildings, that would be the one to talk about. Is that, is that correct? That was it. Oh, sorry. No, please, did I please go Am I misunderstanding? Ms. Ms. Berta knows this much better than I do. Please. That is a reconciliation to hold true to the funding levels by level, elementary, middle, and high, based on student enrollment. So we have to do a true up of that in essence because when we started to develop the budget, we had enrollment numbers that were different than the future think projection just because of timing. So this is a reconciliation of our original number to the future think enrollment numbers to make it align with what the school board's decision was several years ago to allocate based on elementary, middle, and high school funding levels. So if we exceeded 12 and, let's, and came up with a larger number, would that not be the same thing as spreading out the by cost? You've got two separate things. Okay. So the first is based on $135 per elementary, right. 160 per middle, and 230 per high school student right. based on enrollment projections. The 1% would be an addition, additional reduction to every single school, not just those schools that had adjustments and in, in, uh, estimates for enrollment. I see. But also across all departments, or departments where there's something to adjust. So I'm, so I'm not comfortable with moving forward with that today without more information. I just feel like th that feels, uh, without understanding the impact of what that looks like. And I, and I heard you say you could make it happen. Um, I think the biggest impact, unfortunately, will be in the area of technology and instruction instruction and technology to support instruction because those are the two departments where there is more room to not choose not to do things that, that we would regularly have done. 
I think is that. Are there any others, Miss Bird? I think those, those are, are the, the biggest. Yeah. Because literally, the others are very skinny in in what in what's in them. Chair. Yeah, the zombie. I think the reality is we have presented a budget of need, and we have uh, made good faith effort attempts to to streamline it. I think it is a very skinny budget um, across the board, and, and so my recommendation would be to to move forward with the amendment to adjust travel. Um, I'm not so sure I feel comfortable about the one percent across the board. Um, I, I think I concur with Mr. Kelly to a certain extent. Made some attempts tonight. I think we need to move forward and present this to our funding partners and, and, and begin that negotiation process. Because we can nickel and dime it all night long and we're still not going to get $800,000. We're not going to no, find that tonight. We're not going to find. There's going to be a, a shortfall regardless um, unless we're going to really start impacting um, our classrooms significantly. I, I, yes. Um, have the managers of all the cost centers been asked to look at their budgets again and uh, see if they can, you know, whatever it might be, just um, we have, have, I'm sorry, I, do we have 37? I, I, I've lost track of the, is it 37 cost centers? More than that? Never mind. I, I, I can't remember. I don't know. It's, it's all right. A lot. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, just to, um, I'm not, I, I, I have no problem not dealing, doing a, a, you know the same thing all the way across the board. But I, I would like, I would like to see if if those managers can, um, you know, tweak what they have and just just see what happens. See, you know, try a quarter, try try a half. They just and some of them say we'll say, and you know as you said, Ms. Berta, some of some of those centers, there's nothing. We can't fine. That's okay. I get that. I understand that. From a process Otherwise, perspective, my, see my my um, um, I understand about sending the budget of need, but I also understand that the budget of need can go out, be cut, and or or not be accepted, and and it comes back to us, and we'll be having the same conversation now. That's all. So I I'm I, I'm trying to anticipate. Something you know, things down the road, but it's. Uh... Can you tell us a little bit about process, Ms. Prita? Yes, from a process perspective, it's it's always our goal when we get to a March meeting that we push forward a budget of need because we we've all taken an oath that that's our responsibility. Um, as we move forward, we do go back to cost center managers once we begin the negotiation process and we realize that we have to make some reductions to ask them for input. We don't just make cuts um, because there may not be all the details that we have at the high level um, without talking to managers. Oh, I completely agree with so, that. You want them, I want, the, I want the, uh, the, the cost center managers, you know, with their, with their staff to, to look at it. and. and no, I, I, yeah, I would never support that. So just, from the time, the time that the budget is adopted, that's when my conversations and Dr. Heron's conversations begin with our counterparts on the other side. But we've got to get to a point where the board is comfortable with a budget of need. Um, and that's where we need your support in this so that we can begin that process um, and those conversations that have worked well over the last several years in collaborating together. This is just kind of a general question, and I know we've had major budget problems the past, past five or six years. Has there been this kind of a gap every year at this point, and then, and then we, it is our budget of need, we go to the Board of Supervisors, they come back, I mean, so is right some of this kind of a, um, a work in futility at this point? Yeah, quite honestly, where you are in decisions that I think we have consensus on at this point, you are in a better position than we were last year at this time um, with a gap. The, get, the gap is much smaller this year than it was last year. Um, so that's credit to you all if these are decisions that you choose to approve or agree to together collectively. Um, can I have one more? Yeah. This is just, and, and this kind of falls 
it might fall outside of the budget, but it does speak to one of the speakers tonight talked about procurement. We've had a couple emails coming in from people about procurement and about whether the um, some of the bids that we're receiving are the best bids that we can uh, we can have. Uh, I know William and Mary uh, definitely works with SWAM, the uh, small business women minority. Uh, group, uh, I, I'm not quite sure if you could just give us or maybe tell anyone who's listening, what is, what are our, uh, I guess, how much leeway do we have or do we have none? Are we just basically at, uh, we do what James City County procurement tells us to do? Is that basically We it? have shared service with them. Um, I can tell you that in the last year with the implementation of the new financial system, it has given me and my department the ability to really monitor the contracts that we do have in place and enforce those. Um, so while it's been uncomfortable um, for some of our vendors, that is the reality of what we're looking at and that's my job is to assist Kitty Hall and her team with enforcing contracts that were decided um, to be utilized for this division. So um, that I rely on Kitty and her expertise uh, on the county side to really support on that because she knows the VPPA inside and out. Uh, I will be the first to tell you that I'm not an expert in procurement. Uh, that's why I rely heavily on the county. And yes, as a shared service, that would be my expectation that they would take the lead on purchasing. So anyone that has issues with procurement, we're not the right people to talk to. Correct. Okay. And, and I, I, I anytime I sure that get a call, clear. I do direct them to Kitty. Okay. That is correct. Okay. I'm hearing from staff that, that we have worked really well to reduce the budget and that we're in a, a better place than last year. Um, and I think to move to the next step would be to uh, approve a budget of need. So I would like to move to get to, the, yeah, okay. to that section. Yeah, we have to get to the action on okay. it. But is, is everybody just in terms of consensus ready to, to address the action item that's uh, before us later on in the agenda date 9.02? Uh, Mr. Kelly, yeah. So um, I, I see we're getting the health insurance uh, tax on our on our teachers. We have one hundred eighty nine thousand two hundred fifty dollars of revenue. Um, how did we come up with that number? That is one half of the current employees that are on the spousal plan, um, projecting out what the fifty dollar per month extra fee would be, and it's only utilizing fifty percent of that in the event that someone chooses to find health insurance elsewhere. Uh, and we can true that up as we see what happens. Because one of the things, one of the things we really have to look at is, as our budgets continue to get, get trimmed and, and our expenses continue to rise, is that we're going to have to we're going to have to look at programming eventually. And you know, if the, if the Commonwealth, the General Assembly can't afford the education that we're that we want to deliver to our kids, we have to figure out what part of that education that we have to to uh, cut. Um, which is why I asked the question about summer school because summer school particularly K through eight is not required by state code that we do that. Um, it's a savings of about $200,000, uh, about the same as what we're getting from our, from our uh, health insurance uh, charge. Um, so I mean, we really had to look at, you know, if the Commonwealth can't afford the education that we want to provide to our kids, where do we cut the education from? And, and uh, you know, summer school for, at, at two hundred thousand dollars for K through eight. I mean, I get high school where you're trying to do credit recovery and get the kids to graduate, but we really got to kind of look at uh, where where we're going to make those cuts. So I I just think that that needs to be on the table. Madam Chair, yes, I guess to to that point too. I think in the future and, and certainly for next budget cycle, I would like to see us do a, a good long hard look at benefits health insurance specifically because that is about $21 million a year and so I think while we're in the, the local choice, I'm not sure that's given us the best um, dollar benefit. I, I don't want any employee to lose benefits but I, we're, I think that we, there's certainly we could look at cost savings. Um, I know I work for a very small company of 25 here locally, and I manage those health insurance benefits. We have very robust and rich benefits, and they're $1,700 a month 
for a family of five. So, and we're paying around $1,800 a month is the real cost for a family and our most robust. So I would like central office to look at other plans and what is the actual cost of leaving the, the, the choice? I know there's a cost and we're penalized for leaving that, but I'm not sure it's given us the best bang. Um, and before we start cutting programs to, to children, I think we need to, to, to take a look at benefits if we can save them without eroding the benefits that we have. That's not going to help us this year, but I, I would like to have that conversation this time next year. I, I agree with, with you, Ms. Ombi, and, and I agree with what Dr. Beer said at the joint meeting. I, I think we need to look at the whole compensation package, and, and, I, um, and I think taking the next year to do that would be good, because at the end of the day, I would rather see the money even if it remains level or it provides another step increase and in perhaps a COLA, if you can imagine. Um, that I'd rather see that money go into teachers' pockets or to doctors, but not to insurance companies. And so I think moving towards consumer-driven does that, um, at least to some extent, um, because right now all that money is just going to local choice and anthem. Um, so... Um, because make no mistake, they're in it to make a profit. So um, I, I think that Mr. Kelly is absolutely right. Uh, you know, I'm reminded that we recently passed the program of adopted the program of studies that students are now signing up for for next year, and it's possible that next year that program of studies will have to look different if this you know budget season, budget situation doesn't improve at the general assembly. Um, because as you look in the future projections of our budget, the gap just continues to get bigger and bigger as what's available, you know, projecting what's available at the local level and what our needs are going to be as we continue to enroll more students and as our students continue to have more needs. So, um, I, you know, I did want to just uh, comment a little bit about um, if we have to come back and have a similar conversation in May um, in response to what the localities choose to do. I just um, will be, I hope that we can all think, um, uh, be guided by what is provided to us by the, um, by the administration. It's the superintendent's job to recommend and it's our job to adopt or not. Um, and so to that end, you know, one of the menu of items that was provided was this idea of um, expenditure decreases by uh, asking spouses to increase their contribution. I don't choose to look at it as revenue, but rather as an expenditure to de decrease. And, and I appreciate um, using data to make decisions, and however hard it is, um, because I don't like doing that. Um, it's, it's frustrating for teachers who have been here a long time and who have worked very hard for our children and who have gotten used to the benefits that are provided. But, um, you know, when I think about the underwriting analysis showing that spouses have a greater impact on our premiums uh, uh, than uh, and our health care costs than the children do, I think we have. I think we have to take note of that. I think last year's ta ta last year's task force on health insurance recommended this approach, and I think we have to take no note of that. Um, uh, le slightly less than half of all participating employees would be impacted by this. Um, and I think we have to take note of that as, as opposed to not doing a step increase or increasing class sizes. The other options impact more people. So no matter how difficult or horrible it is, I think using that information to make those difficult choices is what we have to do. So um, anyway, I just um, thinking forward, um, that is, is what's on my mind. So I think we have consensus to perhaps adopt uh, a, a budget. So uh, later on in the agenda, I hope I'll be asking for a motion. Any other comments? Um, action items, 9.01 uh, 2017-2018 school year calendar. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the calendar as presented. Second? Second. Any discussion? Will you call the roll? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Thank you. The school year calendar for 1718 is approved. Item 9.02, fiscal year 2018 operating budget approval. May I have a motion, please? Chair, I move that we approve the superintendent's proposed budget with the amendments that were discussed at length tonight. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Any discussion? 
Yeah, Madam Chair, I just want to um, just be clear that uh, because of the insurance surcharge, I'll be voting no for the budget. Um, I agree with the, with the number where we are, but um, I am concerned about the erosion of benefits to our teachers and the taking money out of their pockets. So I'm just going to go on record and say that I'll, that's why I'll be voting no. And I will be voting no also because I believe that we need to be working with our partners and, and, uh, and meeting at, at least um, what, what they're trying to do and understand. So I will also be voting no. Any other comments? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not going to support this. I still think that there is some work that can be done that hasn't been done. And I would prefer to do some of that, or more of it now, than after it comes back from the... That's the only reason I'm not going to support that. Chair? I just want to reiterate that the reason that I, I will support this is because I am taking guidance from our, our, our experts who have said we're at a better position than we were last year in terms of presenting a budget of need to our funding partners. And while we may have to tweak it, um, I feel confident that we're in a fairly good position and we've, we've shaved as much as we can really shave without severely impacting students at class size. Um. I agree with Ms. Ownby in that um, knowing that if the James City County Board of Supervisors and City of Williamsburg come back at that point, we can um, make more adjustments if we have to, but that this is a budget of need and um, we've done a lot of trimming and I also support the superintendent. Uh, I agree. If this is what we need, this is what we need, and we should present it to them. As it is. If we have to change things later on, we can do that, but this opens that, that conversation and moves us forward. That, sirs, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers? No. Ms. Hummel? Yes. Mr. Kelly? No. Ms. Ownby? Yes. Mrs. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Young? No. Ms. Cook? Aye. Thank you. The uh, fiscal year 2018 operating budget, budget uh, approval request to go to the localities uh, is passes by a vote of four to three. Um, I think that um, uh, it's our job now, uh, now that we've adopted this budget, regardless of our vote, to go out and support it to the localities. Um, and uh, I would encourage all of us to continue to think about what um, we might be willing, uh, what we might be faced with uh, in, in May um, if the gap stands at where it is, um, because I don't think the conversation is going to get any more pleasant. So uh, with that, we move to 10.01, uh, board members' comments. Mrs. Young. Okay, um, well, I, I want, I'm going to address the um, author and the Battle of the Books. Uh, uh, first of all, a visiting author coming is, a, is an exciting time for, for kids. It's an exciting time for teachers, and it's a wonderful thing to, to learn more about the writing process and see that in action and actually have an author explain how they got to a finished product. However, the controversy surrounding this year's author has identified the need uh, surrounding uh, well, surrounding this author, has identified a need for a policy and procedure that articulates the school division's criteria for permitting guest presenters to instruct our students. Uh, I certainly recognize and honor the partnership between the Williamsburg Regional Library and uh, WJCC thus far, and I think it's been very beneficial. And I want to thank them for that partnership because uh, it's been wonderful in the past years. However, I would like the school board to be informed of guests who are being invited into our schools. That was certainly brought up tonight. We didn't know. We were uh, blindsided, and perhaps it is because uh, previous authors weren't um, so controversial. And probably more important than us knowing it, I think it's very important that our parents are aware of who is instructing their children. Um, we're a community of diverse opinions and ideas, 
And one of the things that was brought out tonight, we're, um, we should encourage that respect and, and honest opinion. For example, the Battle of the Books, I'd like to know if parents were informed when that list was published for fourth and fifth graders, if uh, that, that they should take a look at the authors because uh, they should be informed with a disclaimer that if they don't know, because the book that is on the fourth and fifth grade book is by Dale Levy. Um, I do think we need to reconsider the visit. Um, book adoptions are important also, and I think parents have to be involved in book adoptions. Last year we had a science adoption, and I asked how many people had come, and hardly anybody showed up to, to view books. Those are books that are being used by our students. Our students are being exposed to the ideas that are, that are in that book. They may not be our ideas, and they may not support what we personally believe. Also, I have a real question about the age appropriate, appropriateness of a fourth and fifth grader being exposed to something that their family should be very involved with. Um, as a parent, I um, would be very upset if I found out that my child had been reading a book that had been on the Battle of Books list, and I did not have a chance to choose an alternative book. Because I'm one of those people that I... I uh, while I respect other people's opinions, I also don't want them forced on my children without my approval. I do think parents have rights, and they should; those rights should be respected. I do want to thank the community and, and Dr. Heron for uh, bringing this to our attention. I would like a policy, as I stated earlier, uh, and a procedure, and I'd like that to be developed by uh, the policy committee and a panel of uh, interested citizens, including parents, uh, so that in the future when uh, people come and address our students that we know who we're talking to and parents should be advised because what where they're coming from because I think that's only right. Um, I don't want um, to, to have this happen again in our district. We're too fine of a school division to, to not uh, take into consideration what what needs to be happen on the behalf of our students and our families. We are customer driven. And if we truly believe that we are customer driven, that we have to make sure that we're respecting everybody's point of views, not just one side. And I want to thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Ms. Ombi. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to speak to the Pathways Program tonight and just wanted to uh, reiterate that while there is some cost savings by not expanding that to, to Jamestown and Lafayette, for me, the, the bigger reason to, to slow that process down for next year is so that we can have an opportunity to evaluate the efficacy at Warhill. And um, I think we will be able to implement some of the um, coursework and, and, and opportunities to engage our students in different ways at, at Lafayette and Jamestown next year. But for families whose rising ninth grader are really interested and excited about the Pathways program because they've heard about it from, from students who are currently participating in it, they can apply to that program at Warhill. While they would not be able to go to their home school, that, that program is open to Warhill. And so I just wanted to make sure that the community knew if you have a rising ninth grader and you really want them to do pathways, um, Warhill could be an option for you. Um, recognizing that I think it's very important that we do um, program evaluation and that we don't just adopt programs because um, that we don't have programs like IB, which has not been evaluated over the years. It's, it has become institutionalized and I, I, without any real strong program evaluation. So I hope over time we can evaluate all of our programs. And I know as our new superintendent is um, implementing her transition plan that she's, she's aware of that. So I, I'm a, a fan of program evaluation and making sure what we're doing is making the impact that we plan and we intend. I um, wanted to give a shout out to all of our bands and chorus. Um, Students, this past week, they um, had their band and chorus assessments, and I had an opportunity to hear Lafayette and Hornsby and Berkeley and Moorhill, and I can't remember how many. I was on two buses. So um, phenomenal. And so shout out to our choral directors and our band directors. Our students worked so hard, um, and most of them received superior um, or good ratings, and superior is the highest you can get. And so I wanted to give a shout out to them and um, to Dr. Heron's comments about happenings. Um, 
Berkeley Middle School had their Hairspray Junior play um, over the weekend, and it was phenomenal. So those students worked so hard, and I have to say, of all, of all of the middle school plays I've seen, that one was 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 at high school level caliber. So um, huge shout out to the cast and and all of the teachers, the teachers who were in the play, um, and teachers who supported the students. It was it was really a nice, wonderful, um, happy place to be. Unlike budget discussion, which is not always a happy place. Hairspray was it was a happy place to be. So shout out to Berkeley for that. Thank you, Ms. Elmby. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I've got a few things, a couple of things to say. First of all, I would very much like to, I know they're all gone now, but <clears throat> or most of them, I think. I really would like to applaud uh, the student athletes um, and, our, our, um, and some of those academic, and those academic, um, highly academic um, students who were here this evening, um, and, and especially the, um, um, the teacher of the year. Um, there are many teachers of every year, and and the the and uh, the the product of their work uh, really was up front and center here um, this evening, and so I, I think that's uh, really uh, really phenomenal. I, I I very much applaud that. Um, the, the second thing, um, I think one of the things that for me the budget process um, has suggested is we've got some key areas in that budget, large areas in that budget, that um, may, may, I think are, is going to require us in the next year or so to really um, take a long, uh, a long um, hard look um, and, um, and a creative look on how to deal with some of those um, major expenditures um, in the uh, in the future, um, it, it's not going to be the same as it always has been in the past. We're going to have to make adjustments, but I do think that, um, and I think particularly in the, um, the health insurance area, um, uh, is, is, um, or, or the overall compensation. For, for teachers. I would like to see a little more flexibility in that uh, for them that can account some of the differences. Um, I. Uh, as far as the concerns about the book, um, the only thing I can say is um, I agree with parents who disagree um, and would prefer that their child not be exposed to the book for whatever reasons um, they may have. Um, but I also believe that it's absolutely essential provide opportunities for students to write. Yeah. Any of them have um, any desire to go to college, to go to areas, to go into professions that really require top level communication, especially in writing. The place you start doing that is in the elementary group. So um, this may not have been the best book or may not have been um, the, the author, I have no problems with that author coming in, but I can understand where parents might, um, might have issues with that. Um, and I agree with um, uh, Mrs. Young that it would be, because I, as we were, I ran over a lot of policies while we were listening to comments. And I, um, and I went to materials and library stuff, and, um, and I didn't see one that specifically addressed um, things like a speaker. So I, I think that's, 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 worth, uh, that's worth taking a look at. I think the intent is to be commended for, for uh, what, uh, what the school, what the teachers uh, want to do, and, and I hope it doesn't uh, discourage them from um, doing it in the future. But I, I do um, think that it is imp uh, important Make sure that the, the material that is used uh, isn't um, offensive to a group. Although, having said that, there isn't a book out there today that is not offensive to some group. Mr. Kelly. I agree with uh, Mrs. Cook regarding the support of the budget, since it is, a, it is now the school board's budget. Um, and. Um, support support that notion 
Um, I do hope our funding partners will work with us to come up with the uh, um, ways that in which we can fund this budget and, and uh, do what needs to be done for our students and for our teachers. Um, in regards to the book um, and, and the visiting author, there should be a process, um, but uh, implementation of education is solely the role of the superintendent of the administration and not of the school board. I would hate for the school board to have to get in the business of approving all visitors to the schools. Um, we wouldn't do much else in our, in our school board meetings if we were to do that. So uh, we, we do want community engagement. We do want um, you know, community members to come into our schools. Um, and as I understand it, the author is not there to talk about that book and the content of the book, but the process of writing and, and how to encourage um, students to write. I don't, from my understanding, it's not, it's not about the book. Um, the author has not committed a crime, so it should not be automatically excluded from our schools. But um, whether the author serves that purpose, I don't know. Um, I'll leave that in the hands of Dr. Heron and her administration about whether that will uh, serve the purpose of teaching our students about writing and, and creating that passion in uh, maybe even in one kid. That I think that would be a great thing. Um, Mrs. Owenby talks about the middle school play um, being at a high school level. That, saying that in this town is a big deal. Um, our high school plays are, are musicals are very impressive. Um, if you have not been to one, um, I would strongly su suggest that you do. Um, it's their their amazing productions. Um, I try to I make it a I try to make it a point to go to all the ones all the, every school. I'm not going to be able to do that this year, but um, I have not been disappointed. So I would strongly encourage everyone to support the musicals in our high schools. Thank you, Kelly. Miss Hummel. Um, thank you. I would uh, like to say my favorite part of the board meeting every every board meeting is the board recognition part. Uh, and tonight was a, a very special night having, um, having so many people honored that represent in my mind the best of the best of WJCC. Uh, from our student athletes to our teachers to our merit finalists, the, this is what our school system is all about. And this is what we should celebrate and recognize. So um, please keep those recognitions coming, Dr. Heron. Uh, <coughs> They, they make this board member very happy to, uh, to be a part of it. Uh, regarding the book, I wanted to thank all of the speakers that came tonight. I, I know it takes a lot of um, courage to come and speak your, um, your, your mind when you see something that you feel is, um, is rubbing you the wrong way for whatever reason. Um, we have, in my mind, uh, I, I think my experience with the visiting author has been, like everybody else's experience, the most wonderful thing in the past. It was just a feel-good experience where an author would come in and talk about the writing experience. Uh, it was so neat for those students to see a book that was published by someone and actually be able to talk and engage with the author about the process that he or she went through to, to write the book. So this has been a, a wonderful uh, collaboration with the library for many, many years. And um, I, I do want to say that I feel this year that there was a misstep, that there was a breakdown in communication, um, because I don't want any of our parents to feel like they've been uh, taken unaware about something or feel like we haven't communicated the way that we should communicate as a, as a school system. Um, we weren't, uh, and, until the emails started coming into us, uh, I didn't have any idea who this author was. I didn't know anything about it one way or the other. Um, I think that if there's any, um, I, I think I agree with Mrs. Young that we have processes in place for, um, and, and not, I also agree with Mr. Kelly, I don't want to be the one making decisions on who comes and who doesn't come. I think that is a, a superintendent school administration role, but that it is, it, it is um, part of our uh, kind of contract with our community that we are open and transparent and 
uh, and communicating with our our parents about anything that that could be considered controversial. So um, that's where I stand. With that. Thank you, Ms. Holman. Mrs. Taylor. Yes, I would like to thank everyone that came out to speak tonight as well. Um, I, I just want to start by saying I respect all our families in Williamsburg James City County Schools, um, regardless. Um, and I think that that communication that Ms. Hummel talked about is the key. Um, our parents, you know, I don't think you can over communicate um, as a parent myself. I, I think that's important. And, um, you know, moving forward, an, an action for us might be to look at our policy closely and, and determine if there need to be any modifications to that. Uh, moving forward. Ms. Taylor, um, I wanted to uh, thank uh, everyone who worked so hard to prepare for the joint meeting. Um, it was a really productive meeting with City Council and the Board of Supervisors, and I know staff worked very hard in uh, coordinating presentations on two major projects that we have underway and on our budget, so thank you very much. Um, I think because of your hard work, it was a productive conversation. So. Uh, thank you. I also wanted to congratulate the Jamestown High School boys basketball team. Um, uh, I, along with Dr. Heron and Mr. Kelly, had the pleasure of attending that heartbreaking game. Um, but they uh, they went all the way to state, so that was that was great, and um, it was fun to to watch. Um, I wanted to also thank everybody who came out to make comments. Um, it is probably the most humbling part of being on this on this dais is listening to the people who come out and take the time to share their remarks. Um, we all take those comments very, very seriously, and so it's, um, it's how, um, how, our, how our democracy works, and so thank you for making democracy work. Um, I want to particularly uh, shout out to Pastor Reed. Thank you very much for reaching out originally uh, early on, and um, it, you've been incredibly respectful and thoughtful in your remarks, and I appreciate that. Um, that partnership and host, hope that we can continue to build trust uh, community-wide. Um, and for anyone I cut off, I'm really sorry. That's the first time I've done that. Please call me. I won't cut you off on the phone, I promise. Um, so uh, anyway, so I, I do feel badly about that. Um, I did want to say that as a former member of the former chair of the Williamsburg Area Arts Commission, which originally funded the author visits, and then a former uh, board member of the uh, Williamsburg Regional Library. I um, am very passionate and appreciative of the partnership that the library has with the schools, and I strongly support it. Um, that you know, There's an MOU in place, and it certainly probably could be dusted off and, and reshaped um, based on the experience that we have had recently. But I think it's important that uh, all of our government agencies collaborate, because that's what makes this community great. And I, would, I want to see that uh, continue. Um, you know, I support promoting writing in our schools, and I view this as an incredibly um, impressive and meaningful way to do it. Um, I support the administration's uh, su uh, handling of this situation and the communication and uh, being responsive to uh, uh, parent and constituent needs. Um, I just, as an aside, have had two kids go through this program and in both cases received notification. So um, that was my experience. Notica notification came home from the principal. I think from you, Mr. Thorpe, actually, um, probably. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there, that that was my, um, my experience. Um, you know, Battle of the Books, that's, um, I have to say that um, that's one of the ways our family shapes our summer, summer reading list. And I can tell you that, you know, we've gotten audio books, and as we drive around the country, uh, over the summer on vacation, you know, I've been stunned by some of the things in those books, whether it's how to eat fried worms um, or, you know, or other more, more uh, sensitive issues. You know, those have been the platform from which me and my children and husband have had some of the most meaningful conversations we've had with our kids. Books that challenge us and challenge our thinking are the, are the way that we grow as people. So, um, you know, families come in all shapes and sizes, and I appreciate the recognition of that in literature and in this community and in our schools. And so um, I hope that parents who are not comfortable with the uh, upcoming author visit feel comfortable opting out. But I think that the families who, 
whose be children will benefit from it uh, participate, and I hope, and I know those children will benefit, and I know that the author, Ms. Levy, will benefit from meeting our kids because our kids are great, and I know she'll leave this community thinking we are amazing because we are. So, um, regarding uh, a policy, um, certainly I'll ask uh, Dr. Heron to work with the policy committee to. Uh, look at best practices. It is an administrative decision, typically, um, and so. Uh, but perhaps there are some best practices and some model policies out there that we can look at and see if there's something that's a good fit for our community. So, Ms. Hummel and Mrs. Taylor, if you would work with the staff to to do that through your work on the policy committee, that'd be great. Anything else? That moves us to 11.01 um, board member comments. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, upcoming events, sorry. We're going to NSBA at the end of this week in Colorado, uh, Dr. Heron and uh, seven, uh, six board members. Um, on the 28th of March, there's the 21st Century Career Ready, Ready Advisory Committee and at 4 p.m. in room 108 of the School Board and Central Office at James Blair. On the 28th also, um, there's the New Horizons uh, uh, board of Trustees meeting at the Woodside Lane campus at 5.30. And on the 19th of April, there's the Policy Committee at 4 p.m. in room 309 at, at James Blair. And that moves us to 11.02 upcoming meetings. Um, we will not be meeting on the 28th of uh, March because we adopted the budget today. Um, but then on the 11th of April, we will be meeting in closed session at James Blair at 6 followed by a work session um, at 6.30, uh, also at James Blair. And then on the 18th of April, we will meet at 6 for closed session here at the Stryker, session, uh, uh, Stryker Center, and followed by 6.30 to regular meetings. So with that, I will adjourn.